so it's always a finding a tough balance between wanting to expand into new markets while retaining focus and expertise. Because if we expanded into 10 new markets, we wouldn't have any expertise and relationships, competitive advantage, and we probably would do less deals while being in more markets. Hello, and thank you for joining us today on the Gentle Art of Crushing It show, where we focus on learning and sharing with our listeners all there is to know about how to create success in our lives. This show stands on the shoulders of giants. Our mission is to empower and inspire our listeners to create the life of their dreams whilst having a blast in the process. Let's celebrate life together. Welcome to the show. All right. Welcome back to the Gentle Art of Crushing It podcast, Passive Investing Edition. My name is Randy Smith, and I am your host today. And I am really excited to have two folks on the podcast today, um, some new partners of Impact Equity, Rob Beardsley and Dasha Beardsley. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Thank you. We're excited. All right. Well, why don't we go ahead and jump right in. Rob, can you give us a little bit of your background and kind of how you arrived to where we are here today in 2023? Yeah, absolutely. So... Uh, going back to the very beginning, uh, Dasha and I are, are brother and sister, and we grew up in a real estate family. Our parents ran a residential brokerage firm uh, from home in Silicon Valley, and they did some fix and flips and construction on the side, all on the single family side of things. And it wasn't until about uh, 2017 where uh, I got into multifamily and kind of introduced my parents to it and, and wanted to get the whole family involved. Unfortunately, at that time, my parents were just still busy running their main business. So I went out and met my business partner, Kent, and we formed Lone Star Capital in 2018. And uh, since then, Lone Star Capital has grown a lot. We've acquired over 350 million in multifamily assets in Texas, our focus being uh, workforce housing in Dallas and Houston. And as the team has grown, uh, I've had the pleasure of bringing my sister onto the team as well, who you've had the pleasure of working with, and she's been doing a fantastic job. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Rob and Dasha. Um, could you give us a little bit of your background, kind of uh, what you were doing before you got the nod from big brother Rob to come onto the team? Yeah, absolutely. So Rob gave a pretty decent background on what it was like kind of growing up and our mindset as a family. Um but I just graduated from USC and I got a degree in real estate development. So it wasn't very clear that I was going to be full-time with Lone Star until about a year and a half ago. I was doing part-time work, started out doing marketing and then transitioned to more full-time doing investor relations and marketing. Are you interested in real estate investing, but don't know where to get started or think you don't have the time or money? Are you stuck in your W-2 because the golden handcuffs make it hard to walk away? If this sounds like you, check out impactequity.net and schedule some time to talk with the founder, Randy Smith. Randy went from massive income to leaving his W-2 through passive income, and he can help you do the same. www.impactequity.net. Okay, very good. So. You actually went out and got a degree from USC, obviously great, great school in development. Um, so that actually adds to your tool belt quite a bit and brings a lot of knowledge and expertise that um, would be really valuable in this value add space that, that you guys are in. So I'm curious, Dasha, with your, with your education, what type, of, what type of benefit do you think that's bringing to Lone Star and to what you're doing in your current roles? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, I benefited greatly from and Rob benefited greatly from that because I didn't really have to be onboarded. Um, you know, I'm, I'm talking to potential hires that we're, we're about to hire. They're asking about onboarding and I'm thinking about my experience being onboarded at Lone Star and it was just kind of a really natural transition and I didn't really have to be taught anything. So I'm really thankful that I had that background and had, you know, the opportunity to get a great education in this field, which uh, really actually drew me to USC specifically. I knew that they had a great real estate program. So that was part of big part of my decision to, to study there. Um, but I also, I did get pretty interested in development specifically. So I'm pretty excited that we're looking to do that in the future. And I would love to get more involved on that side of the business as well. Yeah, no, that's great. We'll, we'll definitely want to get into that a little bit more because I know that's going to be a bigger part of Lone Star in the coming years and excited 
excited to kind of sit on the sidelines and see how you guys do that transition as well. So, so now, Dasha, your your primary responsibility, my understanding, is investor relations, or at least that's been the majority of your and my interactions. And you do um, you do an amazing job with investor relations, and I, I think it probably benefited with you benefited you as well that like real estate has been a part of the family business for years and years and years and years. Then you go off and you have this great educational program. Um, so you have a lot more expertise in this area than kind of our avatar, which is that first, maybe second or third time passive investor. So are there some common mistakes or challenges or struggles that you see first time passive investors running into when they're trying to make that first time investment with you guys? Yeah, I mean, I would say that there aren't actually too many mistakes that are made. Um, I think that it can be confusing as a first time investor because every operator has a different process that they go through. So, um, you know, as much as I think first time investors do this anyways, but contacting the operator or the investor relations associate is really important because a lot of the times, like if someone is investing with an IRA and they all have their own process, just getting everyone in contact and not just running off and doing, you know, going through the portal and, and doing as much as you can kind of helps me. And, um, you know, being in contact honestly is, is really important. I would say as a first time investor, um, just so that I can kind of make sure that they are going through the process correctly. So it's, so it's better to reach out and have you explain something they may not know anything about versus jumping in and putting a bunch of stuff in the PPM that you might have to go back and correct. Exactly. Instead of making a mess, but then we both have to clean up afterwards. Got it. Got it. Okay. So you're saying 24, seven, 365, reach out to Dasha. You're always eager to take the call, right? No, I'm joking. Not so much, but I am patient and I realize that, you know, especially for some of these first time investors, this is a huge deal for them. This is like, could be the beginning of a really like life changing um, investing career. So I recognize that, you know, this is a much bigger deal for it for them than it is me. So I, I really try to kind of put myself in their shoes and understand when they are reaching out to me at non-business hours. Yeah, that's, re that's a really good point. And I think, um, I think some of the really, really big players that might not have the investor relations resources that Lone Star Capital has, I think they can forget how important that first, that first transaction, that first investment is. Cause a lot of folks will, they'll kind of dip their toe and put, you know, 50 grand or hundred grand for their, their first time investment. And if that goes well, um, it's likely they will come back. And in fact, I, I believe you guys have some statistics about repeat investors, I believe. Is that something you guys know off the top of your head? Like how many times people come back to you um, on average? Yeah, I would say it's uh, it's a difficult statistic to know exactly because since we are growing, you know, more recently, we haven't had the opportunity to have some of our newer investors repeat. Um, but I was looking at the other day and I think it's around 25%. Okay. Yeah. And that's, that's about in line with what I'm seeing with my investors as well. And as, as we get more history, we see that number increase too, which obviously as, as um, operators or, or raisers, it's important for us to make sure it's a good experience because our, our hopes is that we could have a smaller bucket of investors that we go back to over and over and over again. So we don't have those first time experiences that we have to keep educating on the front end. So yeah, really good. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, you mentioned a database and I, I know there's just a ton of resources you guys make available to your investors. Can you kind of walk through what that looks like and what you make available to your investors uh, before even technically having to hop on the phone with you guys? Yeah, absolutely. So we do actually, you can check it out by going to lscdd.com. And so that is our company data room where we have a bunch of resources, anywhere from testimonials, our references, track record, our company presentation, so you can kind of get a better sense of what we do, our business plans and things like that, um, as well as case studies, which can be really helpful. So um, when I'm talking to a new investor or a potential new investor, I listen and, and I hear kind of what, what they're looking for and what is gonna help them trust us more. Um, and kind of get them to feel comfortable investing. So sometimes 
Um, you know, I'll send over the whole data room when I feel like they really want to dive into everything. But a lot of people, there's so much information, they might not want to read everything and it, they'll just kind of not even look at it because it's so overwhelming. So, you know, a lot of the times I will send the whole thing, but if they're really talking about, you know, some specific deals like our exits that we've done thus far, then I'll send over the case study. So kind of listening in and, um, I have found it really helpful to have those resources really quick on hand um, and definitely helps get first time investors more comfortable as well as experienced and sophisticated ones. No, no, I can, I can appreciate that. In fact, I remember when you and I first spoke, I think the, you just sent me a couple of documents at first and I think it's important because a confused investor is not an investor that's making decisions. So um, I personally, I really enjoy that you guys create this data room for each of your deals, for each of the companies, because literally there is, there's not a question that I can think of that I can't find the answer in your, in your um, due diligence or data room. So that's just a fantastic resource. So um, yeah. So thank you, first of all, for being a fantastic investor relations person. I've actually received multiple comments from my investors about how great of a job you're doing and the resources you guys have. So so hats off to you and what you're doing there. Um, and, and maybe that's kind of a good transition to go back over to Rob. Part of the, part of the um, materials that you guys make available that a lot of different investor groups do not um, is like the detailed underwriting um, calculations and files that you share. So Rob, I know, and, and actually I didn't introduce you as this as such on the front end, but being the founder, co-founder in principle of Lone Star Capital, two-time best-selling author of two two books that are actually referenced almost daily, I see, on the social things that I'm watching, definitely being mentioned in, in different platforms that I'm a part of quite often. So that underwriting piece, I think that was really kind of your first step on the stage in this space where you really started to make a name for yourself. So can you talk a little bit about um, that underwriting process and some of the unique things that you think you guys are bringing to the table? With Lone Star Capital? Yeah, absolutely. So when we first got uh, going in the business, I set out to build my own underwriting model, which I felt was a really important thing to do, not just for my own education. It's very educational and you, you learn a lot when you build your own model, uh, but also it's, it's really valuable to have a model that you trust and that you have a lot of experience with. So at this point, we've underwritten well over a thousand deals. Uh, with our underwriting model and we've made tweaks over time, which allow us to underwrite more efficiently, more accurately, uh, which is really important because obviously we have a finite amount of time and we need to use our time effectively to find the best deals in our market. So as far as our, our underwriting process, <clears throat> we take a pretty detailed approach. You know, we don't really do a back of the napkin underwriting and then go into more depth. We, if we like a deal, and it passes our initial screening, we'll do a full underwriting on it and really put all the data together. And that actually, you can see in our quarterly webinars that we uh, do with the public, I share with the public uh, with our quarterly deal flow webinars, we, we have a spreadsheet that has the data for every single deal we underwrote that quarter. And we have the, the NOI, the cap rate, the CapEx budget, yield on cost and all sorts of things that gives us really strong insight into our deal flow. And I think that's something unique about us and our competitive advantage is that we're, we're very focused and that our deal flow is only in Dallas and Houston. So we have this curated data set that's proprietary based on all the deals that we're looking at. So it, it gives us that advantage that we, we, at least in our eyes, we see the market very clearly and we feel like we have a very strong finger on the pulse. Yeah. I, and I, I love that you share that with, it's not something that you hold close to the chest. You're sharing it with, with the public, anybody that wants to hop on and, or has access to the links, which is really kind of unique that, I mean, you might be underwriting, call it a hundred deals in a quarter. So you see trends as they're occurring, not 60 or 90 days when the brokers are reporting back to the trends that, that they're seeing on their end. So I think that's something where, you know, Lone Star, you guys can see a shift in the market and make a change in strategy and then offer the benefits to your investors before most people even know that that's happening in the market space. So, so that's, that's super, super valuable. Um, so I, I'm curious, you guys 
have the majority of your assets in and around Houston. Um, I did get to partner with you guys, I believe, on your first Dallas deal. So what was really um, behind the choice of taking a look at a new market? You guys have clearly created a great footprint in, in Houston, um, but I see a lot of players moving in the Dallas market. So talk about that if you can. Yeah, Dallas is one of the top markets in the country. So you can't go wrong being in Dallas. We have done very well in Houston, but Houston is a bit of a polarizing market where some investors love it. Some investors don't want to invest there. And we want to have a little bit more diversification in our strategy so we can attract more investors or provide different offerings to investors so that they can diversify within their investments with us. For example, we have some large investors who have invested quite a lot with us in Houston and they feel like they've allocated enough capital to Houston. They don't want to over allocate. So that sort of precludes them from investing more with us. And obviously we want to grow our portfolio and we think that a strategic move to, to Dallas will allow us to do that. Um, and so it's always a finding a tough balance between wanting to expand into new markets while retaining focus and expertise, because if we expanded into 10 new markets, we wouldn't have any expertise at relationships, competitive advantage, and we probably would do less deals while being in more markets, right? Whereas if we stick with Dallas and Houston, I think we can actually be most effective. So we, we didn't take this expansion lightly as something that we've wanted to do for a long time, and we're not going to expand into a new market willy nilly. It's, it's a concerted effort and we we will we plan to remain very focused so so I'm, I'm interested then like you have the one asset there now i would imagine just simply from uh scalability um and just kind of a strategy to have more resources in one spot you probably will want to grow there pretty quickly this year do you have targets for this year on number of assets within the next 12 months or what's kind of the goals there yeah, that's exactly right. In order, since we are vertically integrated, which means that we manage our properties in house, uh, it, it's very helpful to have the requisite scale to support a staff and an infrastructure to manage the portfolio. Right. So, uh, in, in Dallas, our goal for the year is to acquire a hundred million worth of assets, which will provide us enough scale to hire a dedicated regional manager and begin to scale that infrastructure similar to what we've scaled up in Houston. Okay. Yeah. So, and, and I didn't realize it the first time, actually the second time I've ever been to Houston in my entire life was two weeks ago when I went out and met your property management team and, and construction management team. And Dallas is like four hours away. So it's not like somebody's going to make a quick run from Houston up to Dallas to go deliver some keys or something. So it's important to have the resources and the feet on the street up there as you continue to grow that. So yeah, very good. Now, you, you did talk a little bit about fully integrated and for, you said kind of a high level, it means you have it in-house, but can you talk to some of the benefits and like as a as a group that's growing as fast as you guys are growing, um, like to think about bringing property management in-house, that was probably not an easy decision or something you, you did very quickly. Can you talk about that a little bit and some of the benefits? Yeah, yeah. My business partner and I, we had the goal to vertically integrate for, for, I'd say at least two years before we actually made the transition. So we, we took a very, uh, methodical approach and we, uh, we took it slow and we made sure that all the pieces were in place before making the transition so that the transition would be as smooth as possible. And that's pretty much exactly what happened. We, all things considered, you know, property management's a messy business, no matter how you slice it, but the transition was very smooth. Our properties didn't miss a beat. Our accounting didn't miss a beat because we retained a lot of, uh, the same, I mean, we kept the same accounting firm on the back office. We kept the same personnel for the most part on site and corporate. So we tried to minimize the amount of turnover and, and, uh, transition needed when we actually brought property management in house. So transition was very smooth. The reason why we wanted to do it in the first place was because we wanted to have more control and transparency over the property operations, as well as the personnel, the property management business is a people business and the people are everything, you know, down from the leasing agents, maintenance managers, regional managers, uh, and beyond. So we felt that if we wanted to, we, we want to build this business the right way. And that would require us to, to really have control all the way down the chain 
uh, of the operations. And you mentioned growing, growing quickly. I, I think in a way, having operations in house prevents us from scaling too fast, because if we were to hire third party managers, we could just theoretically buy as many deals as we want. And we just kind of throw third party assignments at the deals and, and keep it moving. But when we're actually responsible for the day-to-day and the staffing, hiring and firing and making sure that, you know, with every property we add to the portfolio, we have to evaluate our personnel situation and say, okay, well, do we need to hire more people? So it's, uh, it's kind of like a natural, not barrier, but an, a, a natural way to make sure that we don't get over our skis. Governor, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. And I, I personally try to invest in operators that are vertically integrated. Um, I've had too many situations where I hear operators blaming the third party property management. And ultimately at the end of the day, as an investor, I'm trusting with my dollars. I don't want to hear excuses about your third party selection. I want to hear how you're going to get it fixed, quite frankly. Um, and, you know, it was really refreshing. I, I spent a little bit of time with um, Aaron out there at uh, a couple of your properties a couple of weeks ago, and I paid particular attention to the employees that I met. And being a guy who's hired a ton of people throughout my sales management years for years and years and years, I think you can tell a lot about organizations by the people that work for them. And it was so refreshing to see smiling faces, um, you know, very, very polite people, caring, giving, let me help you with this. Let me point you in the right direction. So clearly it's a reflection of not only the work that Aaron's doing, but the work you guys are doing with Aaron as well, um, because that is a really, really hard business. And uh, to have a smiling face when a new tenant walks in the door is is probably one of the most important things that you got to that you got to be looking at. So um Great job with those guys. Now, you did mention, and you've made reference to this other partner a few different times. I haven't met Ken personally, but can you tell the audience a little bit about uh, this other guy that's in in the mix and kind of what his superpower is, what he brings to the table? Yeah, yeah. So, like I mentioned previously, Kent and I we we came together to form Lone Star. So we're fifty fifty partners, and he. Uh, brings an extremely complimentary skill set to the table. So he, as as you can tell, he does not like to be uh, front and center. He's very okay with being out of the limelight. He's a NYU law grad, formerly a tax attorney at MetLife, senior tax counsel. And he brings more of an operational mind, you know, dotting I's, crossing T's element to our business. And he makes sure all the trains run on time. And the, obviously, he oversees everything legal-wise that's happening at the firm. So that is, I mean, so as far as what his superpower is, I would say it's, and we talked about this at dinner, I think, last week. He he just makes sure that we're not missing everything because I can be high level. I can kind of uh, put, put deals together or, or find partners and have a vision. But he really actually is on the ground making things happen, especially with some of the unique things we do from a legal perspective, such as structuring 1031 exchanges uh, in our deals and for our investors. You know, there's a lot of different legal elements involved in our business. And most recently, uh, uh, Kent really has pioneered for us a, a new uh, partnership tax exemption strategy that we're doing, uh, which is a really, really interesting strategy, allowing us to pull off uh, v- very exciting deals. So that would just never have been possible without the the legal acumen and the relationships and, uh, it, you know, frankly, the tenacity that he's brought to the table as far as seeking out opportunity. Yeah. And I think, and I don't know if you want to get into it too much here, but you guys just presented or you're about to present to your investor community an amazing new project that you guys, um, through a lot of work and effort from Kent and, and the people around him, um, have been able to orchestrate that really puts you in a position to take advantage of some unique opportunities that could be coming up in the near future in in the markets that you're you're um, you're working in. Can you share even a high level, or is that is it too early to share what's going on there? Yeah, there's. I mean, I'm obviously limited as to what I can share, but kind of just building up on what you and I just spoke about. Uh, we we are currently focused on affordable housing strategies where we are uh, partnering 
with uh, local housing authorities in Texas to restrict our units uh, to cater towards uh, households that make less than the area median income. So we're we're furthering the housing authorities and you know the country's mission of providing affordable housing because we do frankly have a, a major crisis there. So it, it's a it's a really great strategy, win win for for all parties, and not to mention our investors, like you said, who will be uh, able to participate in these uh, really exciting deals. Yeah, and from from an investor standpoint, we saw or we will see like some very significant increases in net operating income due to those efforts on a handful of deals and potential future deals as well. So to the investor community, it's a, it's a, um, not that we're advertising any specific opportunities at this point, but um, to see net operating income increase at the level that some of these deals are, is just, it's a game changer in my experience. So especially at a time right now where the future is uncertain and rent growth may be slowing and the opportunity to implement value of plans may become more difficult. So it, when you when you look at it through that lens and, and view it as a defensive strategy while still being able to uh, increase income, it's uh, really, really attractive. Well, and I think that's kind of the perfect uh, transition over to what I wanted to talk about next is what's going on in this crazy multifamily apartment investing space. We've seen interest rates go up. Um, you know, everybody's got an opinion about what's going to happen, you know, next month with the new interest rate hikes, potentially. Um, where do you see the market today and and um, what kind of trends are you expecting to see continue? Yeah, today we, you know, we find ourselves in a pretty tricky market where transaction volumes weigh down because, as you said, interest rates have gone up a lot and that is affecting buyers underwriting. Meanwhile, sellers are still kind of clinging to what they thought their property was worth six, 12 months ago. And that disconnect is really preventing buyers and sellers from transacting. So we are finding it uh, more of a difficult market to find opportunities in. And, you know, we're not unique in that regard. But I think over the next year, this gap will close itself through a combination of lowering interest rates, as well as lowered uh, seller expectations. So that that gap will close and there will be some opportunity. On the other hand, or conversely, some people believe that there's going to be a big recession and there's going to be distress opportunities and fire sales. And I, I re personally just don't really see that being the case. I think there's a lot of demand on the capital side, in particular for multifamily. And just to outline a few reasons why, number one, multifamily is one of the most stable asset classes uh, in real estate. And real estate generally is more stable than a lot of other asset classes and then when you zoom in inside of real estate, uh, especially through the COVID experience, we've seen a consolidation of, of capital into multifamily and industrial, right? Capital rotated out of office and hospitality, and it's already been rotating out of retail. So all of this capital that wants to be allocated into real estate is now really focusing on multi and industrial. So with that being said, with this massive uh, capital inflow, it's really going to be tough to see a world where prices come down dramatically and there's these huge discount buys because at the end of the day, there's a lot of people on the sidelines ready to jump into the market with their piles of cash and that's going to keep asset prices high. So I, I do think there's going to be good buying opportunities, but I don't think we're going to see the buys of a lifetime like we did coming out of the great financial crisis uh, in you know, 2009, 10, 11, 12. Okay, great. Thank you for, for kind of walking through that. It's always... It's the first question that's top of mind for investors, like, is now a good time to invest in this space? I'm a firm believer that the fundamentals in this space are still very, very solid. Um, it's where I'm putting my dollars and my family's dollars and encouraging everybody I know to put their dollars. So, um, yeah, thank you for walking through that. Now, I, I'd be doing a disservice to the audience if I didn't give you an opportunity to at least talk through um, your most recent book that you just launched that talks about destructure or uh, deal structure and um, some other things like that. So can you share uh, very quickly a little bit about that and what you're doing in that space? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, just uh, published my second book called Structuring and Raising Debt and Equity for Real Estate. The first book uh, that we published was The Definitive Guide to Underwriting Multifamily Acquisitions. So much more niche topic, right? It was just focused on multifamily underwriting. And it, like you said at the, earlier in the show, it, it really... Uh, help build credibility and build a name 
uh, for myself and Lone Star in the space. But with a bit more experience in in the business as well as in being an author, you know, we published the second book uh, kind of the right way. Dasha helped a lot with the the, the new book and. Uh, we've, we're, we're selling at twice the pace, you know, we're, we're just we're doing amazing. It's been a fantastic launch. We're all super proud. I was really nervous about the new book, frankly, because I, I thought that I had lightning in a bottle with the first one and that I don't know if I was going to be able to replicate that. So it's been exciting to, to see the growth. And just as the first book has brought uh, new relationships to us, the second book is doing the same thing. We're able to grow our network, meet new potential partners, meet new investors, uh, ha, you know, have that credibility. So that's kind of a lot about writing the book and, and the benefits to us. But what's actually in the book is a really straightforward guide on both the debt and the equity side of the capital structure, and not just the nuts and bolts of the structure, but also how to go out and raise that capital and how to interact with lenders. And I spend a good deal of time towards the end of the book talking about uh, investor re relationships, whether it be with retail LPs, co-GP partners, fund of funds, and institutional capital, uh, which you know we have continued to push and grow in that space. So one thing that makes us unique is our, our diversity of investors. We don't just stick to one type of investor or have one major investor. We really uh, pride ourselves on working with a lot of different types of investors, big and small. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. I, and I was, you know, you mentioned we had dinner the other night and I, I was listening to you and Craig talk about you know, the $50,000 investor and the $5 million investor. And I was shocked to hear like how much emphasis you put on both. Um, and of course the $5 million investor has to get more attention, but the attention and energy that you put to the, the $50,000 investor has just been amazing in my experience. So, so Dasha, I'm, I'm curious, I didn't, not to put you on the spot, but should we expect to see a new published book with you as the author in the near future? Or uh, maybe, maybe a co-authoring. Maybe a co-authoring. Okay, very good. Well, investor relations, the Beardsley way could be um, a catchy yeah, yeah. new title. You know, it's so. a great idea. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Well, very good. Well, we are. I, we we go through these thirty minute periods very very quickly, but you guys have brought just a ton of value here today, and I really appreciate you guys being on the show. I do have a couple of questions I like to ask everybody before we wrap up. So um, maybe we'll Rob first to you. Is there one specific educational resource that you might suggest for the new passive investor? For the new passive investor, you know, you have to find the right balance because you don't want to dive into something too complicated or something that's going to make you uh, overwhelmed and say, well, this stuff is confusing and for the experts, so I'll pass. So I think it really depends a little bit on who the passive investor is because we have some passive investors who are new, but they're quite sophisticated just not necessarily in real estate. And so some of those types of people have really enjoyed reading my first book, which is all about understanding the numbers driving the returns. And someone who's analytically minded like myself approaching this business may want to under they may want to understand how the numbers actually work. Where are the returns coming from? You know, sure I'm getting monthly cash flow, but how does this all work as from a revenue, expense, debt perspective, right? So that that's a great one. Uh, but for some people that's a little bit challenging and you know focusing on something more introductory uh maybe more beneficial which there's you know to be honest a lot more of that sort of uh material out there than kind of the the more high level um in the weeds type stuff sure okay and dasha anything any specific educational resources that you might suggest to the the newer passive investor i mean we have our passive investor guide which i think is actually you know has a really good balance of being very digestible. Uh, it's quick, it's free, it's on our website. Um, so yeah, I would definitely recommend checking that out. I, I as I've read it, I, <laughs> I really enjoyed it, and I thought it was would be a great resource for a new investor. Okay, and then kind of a fun question: Is there a, a recent? And Dasha, maybe you go first on this one. Is there a recent bucket list item you've checked off the list, or one you hope to in the in the near future? Uh, I, I hope to go to Bali this summer. I've been wanting to go for a long time, even before the, the pandemic, but, um, you know, they, they closed down pretty hard. So I'm really hoping to do that this summer and possibly do some, some yoga retreat. 
Oh, very good. Yeah, actually, I know a bunch of people that are going to Costa Rica for yoga retreats lately. That's what I keep hearing about. So interesting. Rob, same question. Yeah, well, this doesn't sound quite as ambitious, but I'm glad to actually today uh, we signed up for a conference in Nashville. And uh, Nashville has been on my uh, bucket list because I've never been. And I, I feel like I owe it to myself to go out and see the real estate out there and just see one of the major cities in the country that has been a, a real big uh, growth market over the last uh, you know 10 years or so. Yeah, everything from Bali to Nashville, that's fantastic. So, well, very good. And then I guess lastly for, for either of you guys, like what's, what's, uh, what's the future hold for Lone Star? What, where are you guys headed next? Well, Dasha alluded to Lone Star getting involved in development earlier. Uh, so that's, that's something that is on our horizon. It's uh, probably still you know, very nascent and a year or two away, but development, I think is going to be a fabulous strategy for us to implement and give us a little more diversification, still staying within multifamily and in our markets, but a different way to approach deals. So that way we have just more tools in our tool belt. Uh, so yeah, really excited about getting involved in development. Outstanding. Well, very good guys. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate this. Is the first time we've had dual um, dual guest on here. So that's, that's been a lot of fun and you guys brought a ton of value today. And, um, you know, to the, the passive investor who's listening to the show, when we, when we talk about finding operators that are good stewards of your dollars, this is clearly a group that, that takes great pride, puts a ton of energy, and they're certainly experts in this multifamily value add space today. I'm sure we're going to see them doing the same quality of work in the development space in the coming years, but um, a really, really good choice to place your capitals. Rob and Dasha and the team will be great, um, great stewards of your capital. So Rob and Dasha, thanks so much for being on the show. I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, really appreciate you having us on. Thank you. All right. And to the audience, as always, I, I encourage you to continue to get uh, educated, get inspired in the space. Um, take the action of investing in your first passive investment deal. I'm so confident that once you do, you'll continue to put more and more and ultimately become work optional or be able to quit the W-2 and decrease your dependence on the stock market and W-2. So thanks for listening today and until our next time. Thank you. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, another episode of The Gentle Art of Crushing It. It was an amazing episode. We know we sure learned a lot, and we hope you did as well. We want to take a second and thank you so much for viewing or listening to this episode. And please just know that we only ask for one favor, and that is to make this life magnificent. Thank you, and have a wonderful day.